So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our talk. Uh, my name is Tomasz Hrncher and with my colleague Miro Hrncher we'll be talking about how we are upgrading uh, Python in Fedora. Next slide, please. Yeah, I was just slow, sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> So, in the past, before Python 3.9, a uh, new Python was released every one and a half years, uh, which means every three Fedora releases. Uh, like only Paul in the background. <laughs> uh, when you talk, just uh, don't read the chat, I'll do it, and we can do it the other way around. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Python was released every one and a half year, which means uh, every three Fedora releases. But uh, later, Python developers adapted their schedule to match the federal release cycle. So nowadays, they release Python every year, which, which allows us to upgrade Python every second federal release. Um, a synchronized release cycle benefits both sides. Fedora can rely on the regularity, and Python developers receive our feedback from the very first alpha versions of upcoming Python. Uh, moreover, Fedora is the driver of fixes for many upstream uh, projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see on the slide, Fedora offers multiple Python versions. It's because we aim to be a de developer friendly, so we offer a broad spectrum of Python versions. We try to keep up with the upstream and pull requests with new versions are usually open the same day as they are, as they are released. And the availability of different Python versions allows real developers to use Fedora as their developer, uh, development machine. And we also provide other Python implementations such as PyPy, MicroPython, or Jyton. Uh, for every Fedora release, there is one main, main Python. Fedora has a stack of thousands of uh, packages, and this is the Python it runs on, and Fedora itself uh, runs on it. So whether you install Fedora, you install packages, or whether you make packages for Fedora, you are using the main Python. Uh, also, this is the Python you get when you run the Python 3 command in your terminal. For Fedora 35 and 36, it is Python 3.10, and it's a critical component for Fedora. And for, for the many users, it's the only Python users will ever see. Of, of course, you can install different versions, but this one's the main. Um, now let's move on to some statistics about Python packages in Fedora. As you can see, the number of Python packages is, is steadily growing. When Miro gave this talk for Python 3.9 in Fedora 33, there were about 4,700 packages. Uh, two years later, we have 800 more. It makes up about 10% of all packages in, in Fedora, which is probably the biggest stack. Uh, this is the number of uh, packages, not, the comp component, not components. And in case of Python components, it's uh, about 20% uh, of all components in Fedora. Uh, there is one uh, catch. The Fedora 37 number is not uh, final. Uh, there will be... Mm, probably new packages when 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 Fedora 37 is released. So it's uh, at, at this at this time it will probably the growth will be about five percent less as previous Fedoras. Now you can also see that the growth at the beginning is a little higher than the growth now. Uh, that's probably caused by the migration from Python to to Python 3. When every time a, a package migrated from two to three uh, it started to pop up in the statistic. And around here, the, the, the migration is basically finalized. We still have some Python to craft, but it doesn't move anywhere. So we are around 5% growth uh, for every Fedora release. And uh, those packages, that do most of them, not all of them, but from the 5,000, about 4,000, uh, they do require the specific Python version on runtime. So either they require uh, Python API virtual provide, which is versioned, or they uh, provide they require a libpython version library. Usually this is uh, for reasons such as that the uh, location on the disk. So if the uh, package is installed in Python 3.10 directory, you cannot use it with Python 3.11. 
and you need to rebuild it uh, to gain the new dependency. There are also other cosmetic things like the bytecode cache and stuff like that, but it's not really important. So when we when we need to upgrade uh, main Python, for example, now from 3.10 to 3.11, it means we need to rebuild four to 5,000 packages. And you can't just uh, rebuild them all uh, like um, alphabetically or uh, all at once uh, because uh, most of the packages have some build time dependencies on other Python packages. And before you rebuild those, you can't rebuild the others. Uh, so you need to build those packages in proper order. What's problematic is that packages in Fedora and especially in Rawhide, they don't always build. We will talk later about the reasons for this, um, but uh, it basically now it's only important that it really complicates this because when one package doesn't build, anything that needs this package to build as well can't be built either, and you have a chain reaction, and then you have a cluster of packages that you can't really build. Uh, one of the problems with the rebuild is that Python new Python version is not backwards compatible. Uh, this is a intentional, not just a buggy behavior. Uh, for the purposes of Python uh, 3.10 to 3.11 is a major upgrade. Uh, the versioning of Python predates semantic versioning. So some might think that like the second digit is a minor update, but for Python, this is major. Uh, updating the first one is like beyond that. And we never talk about it anymore. So much. Okay, so we covered some general intro and now let's go back in time to fall 2021 to see what we were doing when the very first alpha of Python 3.11 was released in October. Uh, we, packaged, we packaged the new Python version so people could start testing it. We created a package as a fork of Python 3.10 to preserve the little Git history. And we also had to adapt some macros like variables in the definition of the package. Uh, for example, there is the base version variable, which is 3.10, so we ed edited it to 3.11. We rebased our federal specific patches. They are stored in Git, so it's pretty easy. And we also removed some old craft, uh, such as old, uh, old patches. Uh, sometimes the Python main team develops new features in Fedora, and then we work on upstreaming it. Uh, once it is a part of uh, Python, we can remove them from, uh, from Fedora. Uh, interestingly, we can build the new Python package for Python 3.11 in two ways. Uh, either we build it as an alternative Python or the main, main Python. It has a beacon, so the same spec file can be built differently based on environments. And we, we don't need to care uh, what uh, Python version is, is the main. Since Fedora 33, there is no more Python 3 source package uh, or component. We only have uh, Python 3.9, Python 3.10, and, 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 and so on. And the only one of them builds the main Python 3 package uh, from that. What we do next is uh, we write the Fedora change proposal. Usually it's the very first change for the old Fedora version because at the time we are writing it, people are still working on the previous Fedora uh, version. Uh, last but not least, we created Python 3.11 Copper repository. Uh, Copper is a place where everyone from the community can build their packages. Us users can then possibly use the repositories to install additional software uh, to their Fedora machines. And in, in addition, Fedora Pictures can use it as a playground to test new features and ensure that uh, everything is well integrated. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah. And we use this copy repository to do several things. One is that we bootstrap the initial package set. Uh, we build packages in proper order, which means we sometimes need to build some packages without tests or documentation first. And later to build something else uh, using that package. I'd also like to mention that we use only x86-64 architecture for building in Cooper to make things faster. Uh, this brings a risk because the packages can fail on different architectures and we won't know about it. But uh, at this point, in the very beginning, we just accept the, this risk. Uh, once we have the initial bootstrap, we start uh, building the rest of the packages. In the past, we used to add all packages into Copper and kept building it repeatedly and until their missing dependencies uh, were ready. 
This has changed. Now we have a script detecting which packages has uh, available dependencies and can be built uh, at the moment. Miro will be talking about, about this uh, in a while. Uh, building packages with uh, an unstable development preview of Python ultimately leads to problems. The most, most common ones are missing dependencies, uh, Python 3 level incompatibilities, as Miro already mentioned, since Python, Python isn't backwards compatible, when they remove some feature, uh, packages uh, stop to work. And we are trying to identify such problems and report them to maintainers by opening bugzillas. Uh, then there are Python 3.11 bugs. Uh, since we are working with, with development versions, uh, so it's not uh, it's not so uncommon that we find some bug in Python itself, uh, which we report and sometimes we fix it if, if we can't. And there are also some unrelated reasons. Uh, personally, those are the worst failures. Uh, when the package fails, there is an unrelated to, to Python, at least for me. Uh, for example, when package doesn't build with new glibc, uh, I, I can't fix it, so we have to communicate with other maintainer, ma maintainers because we need to rebuild the, the package uh, in copper so we properly test it with new Python. Um, and also sometimes failures happen only in copper so and not somewhere else, so we also need to somehow work around it. Um, there are about 4,000 packages that we were rebuilding in Copper. Uh, since Rohide is ever-changing, we need to keep up with it, with it. And the good thing is that Copper supports webhooks. So every package we have there is rebuilt whenever there is a new commit in this git. And another great feature is that package pull requests also trigger builds in Copper. And uh, those builds are in isolate, uh, isolated environment. So you, you can use it to check if your package will build with uh, Python 3.11 at the time when you are upgrading your package. And if, and if it's not working, it will help us if you fix it right away and don't uh, have to wait for us uh, to open the bug to us. Uh, Miro? Yeah, um, and I want to explain something that we did in the past, and now we are doing it differently for various different reasons. Uh, I think we are doing it better, but in order to uh, see the improvement, I need to explain how we used to do it. Uh, this is called the past. Uh, we did this the last time with Python 3.10, and we used it also for Python 3.9, and I think we initially started with 3.8, but I am not sure it kind of blends in because it's always the same. Uh, when we needed to build the package, the package's independency order, we use the tool that uh, is kind of made for building RPM packages in a def defined order. It's from our friends and colleagues from Software Collections, uh, and it's called RPM List Builder. And it basically gives you, you create a YAML file uh, with all the packages in their order, how they are built, and the YAML file supports uh, RPM conditionals like beacons or other kinds of macros. So you can have in the list the like build this package without tests, then you build another package, and later you build that first package with the tests enabled uh, again. Yeah, this should, in theory, be able to solve cyclic graphs and cyclic uh, build dependencies and and uh, build dependency loops. I'm just gonna skip to the next slide so you can see how the YAML file usually looks like. Uh, it's really small here, but uh, the file itself is like. 500 packages and some of the packages have multiple lines. So here we say that we rebuilt Python 3.9 with some macros set to a different value than the normal. And later we will build it again here uh, with all the macros set to the initial values. And what we did is that we um, created a list that um, contains about 500 packages. And uh, we call that the, the first critical set and it included packages that are really important for us, like setup tools, pip, pytest, and stuff like that. Also, it includes packages that are really important for Fedora Linux for the distribution, like RPM itself, DNF, Anaconda, Free IPA, and stuff like that, and also for Fedora infrastructure. So Koji, Bodhi, Fed Package, Bongi. This is necessary for us to be able to create a compose later when we actually 
ship this change and also to make sure that even if some of the packages are broken and uh, Fedora packagers who actually run Rawhide will be able to fix them. And it also includes a couple more important packages that a lot of other packages require, uh, like NumPy, SciPy, uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, but also packages that other uh, non-Python uh, word is using, like the Boost uh, library or CLang or GDB. The problem with this is that this is not 500 packages, it's like 20 packages maybe, but they all have a lot of transitive dependencies and this YAML file needed to have all of them in, in order. Uh, the problem with that order is that it's uh, sequential. So normally the dependency graph is a graph and if you remove the cycles, it's a tree, but in this case, it's a line. Uh, which means that, uh, or a sequence, uh, which means that if something doesn't build, uh, you are blocked. But uh, in practice, you can work around it by rearranging the list in a way that, that the stuff that's not fixed yet, you move that to the end of the list and move something in the in front. So this is, in theory, entirely automated if the list is perfect and everything builds. But the list isn't perfect because the dependency data changes. Rohide moves fast and the data is from last Python update uh, and you need to update it because everything changed in the meantime. So in practice, there is a human operator. It used to be me, no, it was Tomasz recently. And the human operator sits behind the YAML file, runs the builds in order. And if they are stuck, they need to figure out what to do. It turned out to be really tedious and some of the packages in the list were like lurking there. We never knew if they are really important or just uh, remnants from the past. And it was also really, really slow because of the nature of the, of the sequence other than doing it in parallel, uh, approaching it like a graph or a tree. And then we could basically create this list for entire Python collection of, collection of Fedora's Python packages, but uh, that would be 10 times uh, longer. So what we did there is we used the brute force method or the shotgun method, where basically you take the list of all the packages that need to be rebuilt, which is quite easy to get by DNF repo query, and you build them all at once in copper, which is quite easy because as Tomasz said, Copper has automation to rebuild Fedora packages. Uh, so you define the package uh, to use the Fedora source and you build it. And you set up all the automation. This was already said. And you build the packages in waves. And basically you rebuild everything that wasn't rebuilt yet. You wait until it still builds. And some of the packages actually finish. And so you have more dependencies and then you keep rebuilding the rest until it, it moves. Uh, you're basically kicking it until it moves. Uh, sometimes you, if there is a dependency chain, mm, which is 20 depths in a row, uh, you will try to rebuild that package 20 times before you actually uh, succeed. And it, of course it takes a while before the build is started, before it runs and figures out it has a missing dependency. Uh, so this is, it worked because submitting the packages was uh, easy. You could do something else while you do that. You could watch your favorite TV show, read a book or work on something else. But uh, it took a lot of time and uh, honestly was wasting a lot of uh, uh, resources somewhere in copper. What was done, and we still do that now, is that uh, while some of the packages failed, you need to figure out whether they failed for dependency reasons and you try later or uh, whether there was actually a failure to report. And while everything else was building, we could still trash and report failures. And Tomasz will talk later about how we did that. Uh, one problem here is that, or thing to uh, a challenge that you need to always update the list of packages because new Python packages uh, appear in Rawhide almost daily, at least weekly. And if there is a new dependency loop, you need to figure it out somehow because uh, if you do it in waves, the, the, the cyclic dependency will never, never solve itself, uh, even if you do it a million times. So what we switched now for Python 3.11, and uh, I really like this approach, especially for the copper thingy, is a tool that I called What Do I Build? You can find it on my GitHub, uh, What Do I Build? And basically it takes, 
a list of packages that it also generates. You don't have to uh, use repo query. The script does that for you uh, or for us. And uh, we resolve the build route with uh, DNF Python API, which means we don't actually like initialize a build and try to install everything and then see what was installed because that's uh, tedious. But we only use the dependency solver and the repo metadata to figure out what's going on, what's what's supposed to be installed. So basically, we uh, get the build dependencies from the repo, and we get the initial set of packages that are in all the build routes, and then we tell DNF, hey, install all this to an empty route, and don't install it, just tell me what would you actually install at the end. And it spits a list of packages, and then we cross-reference this list to packages that we want to rebuild, and for each of the package, we can say if we already rebuilt it in our copper or not. And if all of the packages were already rebuilt, we know we can rebuild this one. And if not, we note it down and we move them to the next package. So basically this tool, that's why it's called what do I build, tells us what we can build and what's pointless of building. Uh, it can also detect loops quite easily because for each package, if it's not ready yet, we can put to a dictionary what blocks it, and then we can recursively walk the dictionaries, and when we do a cycle or a loop, uh, we can report it. Uh, we could also, we need to solve this somehow. So instead of a huge list of how to build packages with various beacons flipped, we only note down the beacons that we think are interesting or that we know are interesting. So when we find a loop, we find the beacons or we create the new one and we note down that this particular package, if it's built without tests, can break a loop. And then we need to resolve the, the package without tests. So what the script does is it submits a scratch build with the beacons flipped. And then when you run it later, it downloads the resulting source RPM and queries it for the uh, build requires and source the source RPM on your disk in a cache folder. So every time you figure out if you want to build this package, if it's possible to build it as is, it's reported as possible. And if it's impossible yet, uh, it uh, queries the source RPM uh, to figure out uh, whether it can build it in some uh, modified version. Uh, Amongst other things, this could also lead some interesting statistics. So at the end of the script, it tells you, hey, this package is the most significant blocker. It blocks the most uh, biggest number of packages. Or it can also say this package blocks lesser amount of packages, but uh, most of them are, this is the last blocker for them. So if you, if you fix this package, uh, it will actually let 40 more packages to be built. There are, there are problems. Uh, for the, with this approach, uh, you can't really uh, figure out if you can build a package if, uh, if DNF reports that the build route is unresolvable. It will not tell you why. So for some packages, it just does, eh, eh, can't, no idea. And there is this problem with random architecture build requires. So if you use repo query a lot to uh, figure out build dependencies, you probably know this problem. And that is that if a package is built on multiple architectures, uh, the actual built package that user install, ins users install on their machines is stored in six or five different repositories per the architecture, but the source package is stored in just one. And since there are multiple source packages for each architecture, there's one, uh, Koji picks just one of them, which turns out to be random, and put that into repo. So if you repo query, which what this script does to figure out the build dependencies, you don't always get all the information. For Python, this turned out to be very little uh, case. There was one package that we need to figure out manually. Uh, somebody asks if it's easier to use network X to do this. Uh, yeah, we use, we use dictionaries. Uh, the, the good thing is that while building 5,000 packages is huge, uh, figuring out the dependencies between 500 packages is, is small. You can have that in memory in, in proper dictionaries and it works like a charm. So this is the output of the script uh, as of yesterday or day before that. 
so uh, it goes through the packages. This is one 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 of the package that can't be rebuilt yet. It's module build service, uh, and it figures out from the repo that there are 31 requirements, build requirements. And in order to resolve the build route, it needs a 369 package installed. It goes through the packages and cross-references it to our problem set and figures out that 98 of those are Python packages uh, from 95 different components. And for each of them, it figures like, I've already built this, I've already built this, I've already built this, and blah, blah, until it goes and says, yeah, this one package is not yet built, M2 crypto, so we can't really build much of build service yet. Don't even attempt it. Uh, it would be futile. And at the end, this this does this for all the packages, and uh, at the end, it will tell you some statistics and also spits a list of packages that can be built, but, but were not yet rebuilt. We started in Git, so we can work on it with Tomas uh, and me, because uh, I tend to work in the evenings and he tend to work sooner, so we can take shifts and then we get the data and see what's new, if there are new packages that can be built or not. Okay, so once we have uh, built all packages in copper, or some of them, we, we need to somehow triage them and report the, the fail, 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 fail. Um, we, are, we are trying to, to triage and report all packages that fail to build in Cooper, and we 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 report the bugsy loss. And we are also trying to explain the cause of the failure. Uh, it's not easy and always possible, but we are doing our best. Um, for some for similar errors, we are using regexes to locate them in logs, and we have scripts that help us help us to open multiple pre-filled bugs at once. We are trying to automate it as much as possible, but there is still much uh, manual work. Uh, the goal is to report all broken packages before the next uh, alpha comes out, because it will likely break another batch of pack packages. Um, this is very di difficult, especially with the growing number of uh, Python packages in Fedora, and also due to plenty of changes in Python itself. And uh, because of this, we can't fix all affected uh, packages. So help from other maintainers with reporting it uh, upstream on, or writing the page is uh, cr crucial. And thank you all for, for doing this. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to say one more thing here. Um, <clears throat> sometimes packages don't run any tests. And it turns out that uh, uh, that's not a good idea. So some of the packages actually succeed the build, but are absolutely useless on the runtime because they crash immediately. And then we open Baxillas for the packages that are actually uh, failing to build. And later we realize that like 10 packages don't build because this other package was built successfully and there were no tests or the tests were not good enough. So. Uh, don't just uh, comment out, check to make it built. It's not really helpful. Okay, so on this slide, you can see all the bug cells that were assigned to Python 3.11 uh, tracker. It was about uh, 1,200 uh, packages during the testing of Python 3.11. And most, mo I opened most, most of them, but uh, this number, doesn't contain only Python free loading problems, but it also it it contains also various other bugzilla such as fail to build for source of uh, build from source. Uh, basically, every package that wasn't building we mark it as we mark as blocking Python free uh, We are doing this because uh, f for some of our scripts we we see some statistics and. Uh, yeah. In addition, some, some packages uh, were broken on many levels, so fixing one error led us to un uncover another. So the, there is various uh, problems sometimes. Next slide, please. So here we are in November, December, and January. Uh, every month, one, of, uh, one alpha was released. And, uh, Every time we were updating the package in Fedora, so developers could use it for testing. 
And the good thing about Copper is that the new commits are immediately built uh, as the main Python package. So, um, uh, but we have to do some basic checks because uh, during the alpha stage, there is no guarantee of binary stability. So sometimes when packages see code for extension modules, they start to seg fault with the uh, new Python versions, uh, Python version. Uh, and if this, this happened, we had to do a partial reboot strip, meaning rebuilding all Arch packages that uh, the affected package depends on. Um, one, one tricky thing about Copper is that the, uh, when there are multiple builds with the same uh, Nevera, name, Epoch version release, uh, Copper uses the oldest one. Uh, likely build it previous uh, alpha. Um, instead of bumping releases, we have script, scripts deleting uh, old succeeded builds. And we'll, we also triggered a re rebuild of all packages in Copper to discover new failures or possible fixes. Um, Copper is significantly faster than it used to be uh, in the past, but uh, rebuilding all packages still takes about uh, three days. And it's, it, it really depends on if there's uh, another big project building in it at the same, same time. Uh, finally, in February, something else happens, and that is this Fedora 36 has branched, uh, which means that the Rawhide is uh, Fedora 37. Up until this point, we can't really change anything in Rawhide because it would affect Fedora 36, and we only want to do this in Fedora 37. Uh, I think we are one of the very few teams that start to work on Fedora 37 before its raw height is Fedora 37. At this point, until this until this happened, raw height was Fedora 36. And if you report back to us, for Fedora 37, when raw height is Fedora 36, many maintainers don't consider the bugzillas really urgent. And it's really hard to explain like, this is we need it now because we want to test everything and this package is blocking others when the maintainers have full plate of other bugs that are actually uh, happening right now in Rawhide and not in some playground copper. So this point in the Fedora release schedule is really helping us to get more attention to the bugzillas. Unfortunately, it's not good enough. Some of the maintainers still don't consider Python 3.11 Bugzilla as important because Python 3.11 is not yet in Fedora, right? It's only in some copper. So we'll get to that later. What happens later, uh, March, uh, May, we do the same stuff. Uh, if there is a new release, we must rebuild everything. Uh, if there are new Python incompatibilities, we report new Bugzilla's. If there are new breakages in Rawhide, and there are always some breakages in Rawhide, uh, we report those. Uh, we had some problems here with the stuff that's in this kit uh, versus the stuff that's in the repos. So sometimes what happens is that maintainers commit something to, to Git with no intention to build it at all yet because it's work in progress. And we can't know that. We trigger build for every, every commit. Uh, also, if they commit something to uh, the package in order to build it in their site tag, we try to rebuild it immediately in Copper because it's a commit. And sometimes we have problems with that and we need to figure out if this problem is temporary or if we need to report it. And obviously, uh, there are dependency issues uh, in between all the packages because sometimes packages get updated in Rawhide without checking the impact on other packages. So. A library is updated and suddenly five packages that were fine, uh, we can't really rebuild them with the new alphas anymore because uh, a problem needs to be fixed first. Uh, ideally, uh, we would freeze everything and tell everybody not don't change anything and then this job would be quite easier. But uh, considering it takes a year, uh, it would mean that uh, Fedora can't ever change anything but the Python version and that's not realistic. Uh, okay, so we are in May. Uh, in May, there was a uh, release the first beta, and it's an um, important milestone for us because at this point, Python entered the feature freeze phase, and we started to plan a Python mass rebuild uh, in Fedora. 
Uh, first, we needed to figure out whether some crazy club packages uh, were ready um, and some weren't. So we began to focus on them, uh, offered help to form itineraries and even fixed some of them by us. And by the time of second uh, beta was released, we were prepared and could announce that we, we were starting with uh, the mass rebuild. Uh, as Miro already described, the process process of uh, resolving packages, package dependencies, we, we also use the same approach of uh, for rebuilding in Koji. Uh, to not break everything, we're building it into a side tag. And maybe you remember, as I mentioned, that we're building only on AX8664 architecture in copper. So this is the time when we were discovering the failures for different arches as Koji builds in different type of architectures. And we also had to sometimes step in and work with uh, maintainers or fix it uh, by ourselves so we could continue if uh, it was uh, blocking for us. And now we will be talking about merging the site tech. So when we build packages in site tech, uh, it's because that if we don't, uh, that as soon as we update Python, suddenly uh, everything is on fire and nothing installs. So we do it somewhere else. And every time you do something somewhere else, the original place is still moving. And Rawhide is really like rolling, rolling, rolling. So uh, we fight this urgency to do it properly because it will take a month. And uh, during a month, uh, all the packages would be already updated in Rawhide. And we would need to synchronize those things uh, over and over again. So we have uh, another tendency, and that is keep the site tech open to the bare minimum. Like ideally you rebuild everything immediately and merge, 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 and nothing happens. Uh, that's not possible because even with the what do I build approach, it takes a while before everything is rebuilt. And ideally when this is done and everything is rebuilt, we merge the site tech back to Rawhide, but it's never done. There are always failures. And even if failures are often fixed, new failures pop out somewhere else. So there was never a point when we did this, when every Python package in Rawhide would successfully build. That's just not realistic. Uh, so we need to find the too soon, too late problem. If we merge the site tech too soon, there would be a lot of breakage because not of all the package would install. And if we merge the site tech too late, it would create new problems. So we try to uh, make it run two weeks tops and there is also a Fedora mass rebuild. And if the Fedora mass rebuild happens before we merge the site tech, then we need to start over. Fortunately, uh, the mass rebuild is like one month or two months after we uh, start this. I think it's one month. Uh, so we never needed to keep that open that long. And when we decide to merge the site tech, it's basically like a point of no return because suddenly Rawhide is using the new Python version. And it's really hard to get back. But during this release cycle, we were considering to do that even after that. So it's not really a point of no return, but it's rather a point of a very, very complicated return. You can always revert stuff. Funny thing is that uh, the what do I build scripting uh, was completely broken when we merged the site tech because it expected that Rawhide has Python 3.10 and you can resolve stuff there and figure out what depends on what. Uh, but suddenly, we had 3.11 everywhere, also in Rawhide, and it just reported, I can't resolve anything that's yet to be rebuilt. So what we do is that we cache the metadata from the day before the site tech was merged, and we use the cached metadata, which obviously is already very, very outdated. Uh, so what do I build is not that useful after the site tech is merged. In reality, this time, the site tech was merged in 10 days, which uh, I've checked is the same amount of days as the last time. So it's probably just down normal. Uh, and we managed to build like 3,700 uh, 3, or something like that packages. And about 500 packages failed to build. But they went through the list and it was all libraries that nothing depended on or isolated clusters. There was nothing that the Fedora installation media would use. So we said it's not important. And I know that for the package maintainers, all of their packages are important, but uh, on the scale of the distro, we identified nothing important. 
And during the years, we already broke a lot of important stuff. So we have some experience about this and we we know what's important in this regard. When the site tag is merged, uh, suddenly the Koji build root has Python 3.11, but the Rawhide repositories, they don't. It takes a while before that happens. And the longer this takes, the more complicated it is for package maintainers and people who use Fedora Rawhide on their CI, et cetera, to actually consume this. So we try to make a compose really fast after we merge the site tag. If you don't know what compose is, really, really simplification, real simplification is that every night the repo is created. And when the repo is created, also the installation images are created and a lot of stuff is checked. And if something doesn't check out, there's no repo, the compose failed. And the packages in Rawhide repositories are the one from previous day. So if we create some large disruption, uh, we don't get a compose and then it's really complex to, for us to fix it. This time there was a problem in Anaconda with Python 3.11 and the compose failed, but uh, we managed to fix it immediately. So the next compose next day, uh, so after 11 days we started building, people could consume uh, 3.11 in Rawhide. This one is also on my, I was waiting for Tomas to speak and now I noticed the little M in the corner. Uh, What's important that when we actually put 3.11 in Rawhide, suddenly the bugzillas that are still open, uh, finally, it actually breaks stuff. And before it's broken, many don't have the tendency to fix it. And now it's really is broken. Your package don't install, your package don't build. You can't update it. You can update different packages that depend on your package. So now the uh, response time for the bugzillas gets much better. Um, so, but still not everyone. Uh, unfortunately, many maintainers don't consider Python 3.11 bugs priority until they are, until it actually breaks it. Uh, many maintainers, uh, although they are active in Fedora, they just don't read Bugzilla or I don't know what's going on. You never got a reply there. And we opened, as Thomas said, 1,200 packages, uh, sorry, Bugzillas. So we operate on scale. And unfortunately, the non-responsive maintainer policy does not really scale because it assumes that you try to contact the maintainer, talk to them and figure out what's going on. Then you write emails somewhere, open another Bugzilla for them. And you can't really do that for 20, 30 packages at a time. And unfortunately, despite the intention of the policy, many maintainers uh, do take uh, an try for the non-responsive maintainer policy as a personal attack. And it's not really pleasant when people uh, assume ill intention here. So what we use now is the fails to install policy, which is much easier to handle because it targets packages and not people. So if you run a script that tells this package is bad, this package is bad, uh, somehow that's much more acceptable to maintainers then this person is bad yeah, yeah that's you don't do that right so uh this policy actually targets packages and if something somebody does not reply it allows us to orphan and eventually retire the packages that were not rebuilt with a new python version which is a good thing because if they were not rebuilt users would not be able to install them anyway so they just take place in the repositories and uh, they scrub statistics but they are not useful there is existing tooling to open Bugzilla's for packages that fail to install. And I'm running it normally for all Fedora, not just for Python. And I keep it maintained. And this really saves us a lot of trouble trying to communicate at scale with people who don't. Still, unfortunately, uh, the policy is targeted for Bugzilla's that are in a new state, indicating that nobody's looking into it. And then there are remain reminders and the reminder says, if you set the bugzilla to a signed state, we'll assume you are working on it and we'll stop bugging you. And unfortunately, what happens still is that people do assign the bugzilla to a signed to avoid the reminders, but then nothing happens and you need to figure out what's going on. Fortunately, those are individual packages and not hundreds or dozens. As I said, uh, we were about 500 packages left 
when we merged and most of them are already fixed at this point. Unfortunately, right after we merged, started the opening all the uh, policies and starting to uh, getting some progress, uh, upstream Python decided that they have too many upstream release blockers. And they said, if all of the blockers are not fixed in, I don't know, end of the week, they'll delay uh, the release of Python 3.11 by two months. And with the yearly uh, release cycle of Python, this is really tightly coupled to the Fedora release cycle. So the final is in October and the final is in October. It's basically we all target the same month. So if Python would be released in December, yeah, this year it might have been December, right? And then what the hell, what are we going to do? because uh, we would not even have a release candidate when Fedora is released. And before release candidate, we don't have any binary compatibility in Python. So we would release Fedora 37 with uh, Python that will not be uh, compatible with any future updates possible. And that's just too bleeding edge. Uh, so we considered several scenarios. One of them was to revert immediately to 3.10. But it would be a really a lot of work and, and uh, a lot of mess because Rohide went from 3.10 to 3.11. We would made it go back to 3.10 and then back to 3.11. And it means that we would need to do two more mass rebuilds of Python and it would triple the amount of work. The other possibility was that we wait after Rohide is Fedora 38 and we only revert it in Fedora 37, which means that uh, Fedora 38 would remain on 3.11. Uh, but that would complicate pre-beta testing because uh, everybody would say like, yeah, this, this is buggy, but we are going to revert the Python version next month. So let's wait. So that was also unfortunate. Uh, what's awesome is that uh, many of CPython uh, upstream developers pulled it out and all the blockers were fixed in time and all this revert conversation was actually moot, but it gave us a lot of things to consider. And now we will be less nervous when this happens again, I guess. Okay, so third, fourth, and fifth betas were, uh, were released also in July, but uh, there still wasn't a guarantee of ABI stability. And since no new f features were allowed, but uh, possible, possible reverts could, could change it. So before shipping it in Fedora, we upgraded it first in Cooper and checked the ABI. And in case it changed, the minimize rebuild of all Arch packages, it's about 600, uh, would be needed. But for, but for Python 3.11, it wasn't uh, required. Uh, but what uh, has changed was the bytecode magic number. Next slide, please. Uh, PYC magic number is a part of bytecode files. When you run Python script for the first time, imported modules are compiled into bytecode. And so next time you run the script, it can skip uh, compilation and it, it runs faster. Um, these bytecode files have magic number in their headers, which specify uh, with what Python version it was compiled. And it's not possible to regenerate those files without package rebuilds. So when fourth beta of Python, 3.11 introduced a uh, breaking change. All Python packages had to be re uh, rebuilt again. Mm. Luckily, a few days after this release, Fedora 37 mass rebuild was happening. So it took care to, uh, of, uh, of rebuild, but still some packages failed to build. So when Fedora Relangs opened, uh, failed to build from source Bugzilla's, we set them as blocking for PIC magic number Bugzilla. And so it's tracked. And it was about 60 packages. Uh, some of them were already fixed, so it's about 50 now. now. Yeah, uh, well now we are. Uh, we have August, and we expect some things to happen, and I hope that they will happen on time. Uh, one of them is the first release candidate of Python, which was scheduled for Friday, and it's Saturday, which is not uh, uncommon. Uh, if there is a release of Python scheduled for a day, it usually means it will happen in that week or like around the week or maybe on that month or uh, it might happen someday. Uh, we hope it will happen in August. Uh, there is the Fedora 37 beta freeze in August. 
And we really, really want to get a release candidate version of Python into the beta. So if we if the release don't happen before the freeze, we'll expect uh, we'll ask for an exception to make it there. And the idea is that when beta is released, it should have a, the same Python as as the final. And release versions of Python are pretty much the same as final versions of Python because up until release candidates, uh, all of the committers to Python can commit anything, almost. And after release candidate, only one person, the release manager, decides what commits go to the release, and they are very careful not to break anything. I've never seen real breakages after release candidate. So the plan is to ship Fedora 37 beta with at least the first release candidate or another release candidate if that happens. Uh, this day in the morning, 85 packages uh, in Fedora still fail to build and fail to install with Python 3.11. And we'll make, make sure to either rebuild them or to retire them before, uh, before the final release. Uh, once uh, the beta is released with the new Python. We hopefully get some users, beta testers, that will run Fedora with, uh, with Python 3.11 and report uh, runtime-related problems. We got a lot of problems discovery when the packages are built, and we have the fails to build from source that determines that something is broken. But there is still a huge area of problems that could be only discovered when you actually run the Python on your system, uh, not when you build the packages. Uh, usually, uh, there are some small problems discovered during beta, but nothing really critical, like a Python, new version of Python ate my computer or something like that. That never happened before for us. Okay, so we're back in September and October and it's time to finalize uh, this project. So we're expecting the last release candidate at the beginning of September, if everything goes according to um, plans. And afterwards, so there will be a few weeks before Fedora 37 final freeze to make the remaining packages uh, either build or retire, as, as Miro mentioned, because there is no point in shipping broken packages, packages so it's better to retire them, retire them and re reintroduce them later once they are fixed. <clears throat> uh, Python 3.11 final is planned for 3rd of October, and it's uh, one day before Fedora final freeze. So in case it's delayed, we will be asking for freeze exceptions so we can ship it in Fedora. And we will be also obsoleting uh, uh, removed packages to unblock uh, upgrade paths. And maybe you're asking whether when the Python 3.12 uh, will, will be released. So it's uh, planned, uh, first alpha is planned for the, the same day for the 3rd of October. So once uh, we finish these finalizing steps, we can go back to slide number seven of this presentation and we can start uh, all over again. It's a never ending story, uh, but fortunately it takes a year and the steps are quite diverse, so it's not that boring. Uh, that was all from us. Uh, this is how we do it. Uh, if you have some questions, we have five minutes. Uh, I'll switch to the uh, uh, questions and answers tab. Uh, but if you want to see some links, communicate with us, go to Fedora Loves Python. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't have stickers printed yet with the new, new stuff, but hopefully before uh, an actual in-person Fedora conference, we'll, we'll get them printed. Okay, uh, question and answers. Uh, so will Python 3.11 be on schedule? Uh, well, uh, we can't tell before it actually happens, but it looks that way. Uh, there is always a risk. Uh, there was a huge blocker uh, this week, and fortunately it's fixed. Uh, we really have fingers crossed for the release candidate because like shipping the final release of Fedora with release candidate would probably not be perfect, but it would be okay. Shipping final Fedora release with a beta version, that would be a disaster. Uh, then there is a question, how do we handle maintaining all the Python 3x components across Fedora releases? I'm going to take that to the end because it's complicated. Uh, how do we ensure build ordering in copper? And do we start build batches manually? I think this talk actually answered that question. It, if not, we can talk about it later in some social uh, museum or something. But uh, 
we start build patches manually when we need to do it for the new Python version. We basically brute force it still. And when we have problem, we delete some of the builds and then we use what do I build, which preserves the order. I'm trying to do this fast because we don't have that much time. Uh, Alexandra asked for a very excellent question. Uh, can we uh, test and do we test the compost before the site tech is merged? Is it possible? I've been told for three years now that some people might know how to do that, but then they don't remember how they did it the last time. And it's not like I, we can do it. We, we ask every release, can somebody run the test compost for this? And then somebody like uh, from Fedora QA or Fedora Infra sometimes is able to run a partial compose or something like that. But uh, it's not that easy. I wish it would. I wish I could click a button or run a command, run the compose, see the result and say, this is okay, let's merge. And I hope it will happen someday, but not yet. Is it better to ship free 10 or beta RC? So let's sort it. Uh, the best way is to ship the final release. The second best way is to ship a release candidate. And then we have a decision whether we ship beta uh, or whether we revert. And that would be a very hard decision at this point. I hope we don't have to make it. It will depend on a lot of factors. When does it happen? When we need to make the decision? Or uh, what uh, ABI compatibility do we expect for the next beta? Like why the RC was not released yet? Is the blocker that blocks the RC likely to change the ABI or not? OK. So we, I have exactly one minute to explain how are we maintaining all the free X components. Uh, enthusiastically, uh, cleverly, and uh, complicated, and whatnot. Uh, we use a tool called Fairy Pick that allows us to cherry pick commits between different Fedora packages. We, when we create a new Python X Python Free X component, we fork from the previous one. We preserve the Git history. So Git is quite clever, and that we rename the spec file is not that hard for them. So when, when we open a pull request in this Git for one Python, we can run a command that creates the same stuff in Git for a different component, and then we push there. And we maintain our patches in, in GitHub as commits uh, to be able to cherry pick them easily uh, without dealing with patch files. Whew. I hope that answers the question at least partially. New poll pickles. Okay, dismiss. That's it. We are now at the end. It's 70.30. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomasz. And thank you. Thank you. Paul. See you around. See you. Bye-bye.